Now, this map has been missing for many years. Um, it is, it has been noted in the minutes of the village that it was made, that it was prepared. And then you'll see it says here on page 46 in the minute book, it mentions it again. And through those years, mayors and uh, trustees have been trying to find this map, but it was missing. And it was a big deal to be told that the Morrison map needed to be found. And we never, never could find it. It was, nobody know what, knew what ever happened to it until uh, a few weeks ago, Lee, Lee Ann Maneri, who was the manager of the Bank of America, which has just gone out of business in Montgomery, uh, was told that there were some things up in the attic. Would she like to go up and see what they were? So she did, and immediately, with her knowledge of historical events in the village, of which Leanne is very interested, she happened to find this map stored upstairs <clears throat> in the attic of the Bank of America, along with two other uh, less valuable ones that are only uh, blueprint maps, which are of no, diff no use for us. But this is the map that's been in constant concern about whatever happened to the Morrison map. Now, it was called Morrison because Mr. Morrison was a surveyor who owned the house at the end of Clinton Street which was formerly the groom home and uh, is now the office of McCarl, the lawyer. That was called the Morrison House. And apparently that's in, in those years, he, they conducted the business in their homes of a surveyor. That whole property was, was very historic because that's where our first mayor of Montgomery, 1810, lived. That was his home. Uh, and uh, Leanne Maneri also found in the attic of the Bank of America, she also found the uh, large, heavy, heavy, heavy plaque that was, was bolted onto the front of the bank, on the First National Bank. There had been ones on there before that only said National Bank, but this one says First National, because it became First National along about 1915 or so. And then it became the bank, the First National Bank until that, until the, uh, the Highland National of Newburgh purchased it. That was in the year of Ken Green, our wonderful bank manager, cashier, Jack of all times. Well, you have to say it all over. This, this is the uh, cemetery, the Riverside Cemetery. There was a proposed bridge that was supposed to go right down across from the river across the river at the end of the proposed Sears property that would connect over to the, to the, uh, to the minister's house at Brick Church. It was proposed because the people did not want to have to come around this way, pay a toll at the toll bridge to go to church. They felt they should be allowed to go right straight down. It did not pass. They never built it. S meanwhile, they had to pay a toll to Mr. Smith, who was the toll master. Now, this Pleasant Avenue and William Street is here, but they also, now you notice that says Pleasant Street. That's what was proposed. Has no connection with Pleasant Avenue at all. 
Now there's also a Holland, H-O-L-L-A-N-D street that was planned to be right along here. It never got built. Now this is today's Taft Avenue development by good case. Uh, after World War II, so that this is a meadow on this map. The meadow belongs to the, to the, uh, to the Jennings farm. This is all the original Jennings farm. All the green you see here. Now it's Taft Avenue. Now there's a little street now that connects on here at the end. See that where at the end there? Right there where it's the end? All right, that street was supposed, Elizabeth was proposed to go all the way down and come around this way. It never got done. Instead, the senior, Thomas Sr. owned a farm at the end of this and he built a big barn there and he had this, turned this all into farmland. It didn't get it, it never got finished. Now this says Montgomery Street. That was a proposed early street in 1868, but it never got built at, by that name. Instead, it connected on with a little street to Taft Avenue. This little jet out here connects now onto Taft Avenue. Elizabeth Street is the same. It's much shorter, but that's what they, that's the same dimensions. Now here, we're going over the bridge. This is, this whole area here is where James Ward cut down his trees, logs, in order to make that bridge across the river there. The bridge is much narrower on this map because it was double, double laned when the next bridge was put up. And this is the Christ, the early Christ, Christ mill. C-R-I-S-T, family. They built a Grist, G-R-I-S-T, mill there. And this is the big house of that Christ family. They were descendants or ascendants of the Hathaways. The Hathaway, Mr. Tom Hathaway, lived on that in that big house before it was, before they moved into the village. That was always called the Hathaway Waring. See, it says W. W. Waring. W. W. Waring was Mr. Hathaway's grandparents. Was the first doctor here, Joseph Virgil Waring. He served in the, in the. Uh, out on Admiral de Gracia's fleet out in the Atlantic during the Revolutionary War. He built this farm. It's at the foot of Albany Post and 17K. The house burnt completely. Beautiful big colonial home. These are the barns. There was one directly across and there's two other big ones. They were burnt. A suspicious fire uh, after the family had all passed away. This was the Enright, E N R I G H T family. They're all passed on, no more of them. And this is 17K as it goes along. Okay, now to this farm also was land on this side of across the river. He owned this, Dr. Whalen and his son, Joseph, <coughs> also owned property at the end of Elizabeth Street. This is where we had the first Catholic masses here in Montgomery. And then his son, Joseph, who was a lawyer and a realtor here, owned that little house, it's still standing, the first house in Elizabeth Street. And they were going to have, and it's marked on the map, not on here, 
but on other maps it's marked R.C. Church, means Roman Catholic Church, that was built for that reason by Dr. Whalen until we went up Union Street and built a bigger one. Now, we're coming down over the bridge. This was Ward Street, but before that, it was called Water, W-A-T-E-R. It's in all of our writings as Water Street. But in 1868, they must have changed it because it says Ward on here. Now this is the mill. This is James Ward's mill and his adjoining building. And this is the dam that was built there for power for his, for his uh, mill. This box here is the paper mill that was next to the grist mill. The paper mill also burnt about 11, 1911 approximately. And then the river goes on down without any mark, anything, no homes, no nothing on this side. There was a cooperage about here where the man here made coop, made barrels. I forget his name right off. Um, this is going up Ward Street to that big farm, which is now Skip Chambers family. This whole section here. It was three different, very influential families that were active in the Revolutionary War and, in, and uh, afterward. And their descendants were active in the Civil War. Lahamadou was one. El La Hamadou. Now Clinton Street is no different. Ward Street. This is says Fort F O U G H. That's this little street here, next to the Methodist Church. It's called that because. The early family who owned all of this land was called Puff, P-O-U-G-H. But this is the French way of spelling it, Fort, F-A-U-G-H. Now he donated the land for this church, and he donated that little short street, which is today part, actually called Walkill Avenue. Technically it's narrower, and it's originally his. And then, then the, the parsonage for this church was built halfway between here and here. This is Spring Street, which is where all the early springs were that gave the water to these early residents around here. And this is the railroad track going around. It, show, it doesn't show the creameries. We had two creameries right here, Beeks and Mick, Mick. McDermott. McDermott. Thank you, Dottie. You're welcome. And that's just going on out. That's Factory Street down there, which is where all the Crabtree families lived. On the corner was Miss Patchett's uh, father, who was a brother-in-law of the Crabtrees. He built where is now Walk Hill Art School. He, he gave... He sold all this piece of property here to the village for a minimal, a very minimal hundred dollars for them to drill or to dig and try to get water in that area, which is now taken over by a developer for senior center, senior citizens. But that land is where our pumping station is, right there. We called it a pumping station. They called it a water works. It pumped water from these springs, six, six springs, from here up to the standpipe. And then, with the help of Chauncey Brooks and Mr. Patchett, who was on the water board at that time, those two men, are the ones that are influential in getting us water to come down into these, into these 
all of these lower uh, hydrants and into our home. Now this is this is all Chambers's Chambers's farm since 1865. Skip's great grandfather bought all this land, but it was sold for developments. Um, the first, the first um, blacksmith here had his first blacksmith shop right there on the corner of Goodwill Road and Valley and uh, Clinton Street. Um, now this Clinton, this is Goodwill Road, which is now where John Van Arstel's family lived at one time in a house there on the corner, plus one that was up further here at the end of Boyd Street. And of course, this whole area was all purchased by Chauncey Brooks at an auction because James Ward married a smith that lived in a little tiny tavern down here by the bridge, which is now Barbara Conroy's and, and Richard Conroy's. It was moved up there, up to Union Street. But it was in that tavern right there where all the village rules, everything was all conducted in, in the Smith Tavern. And uh, When, when the Smith family passed away, James Ward's family, I'm not sure about the exact membership, but this whole land had to be sold. All of his land, James Ward owned all of this. And it had to be sold. And when it was, Chauncey Brooks bought a lot of it and, and put parcels on it and built his Victorian homes. Now, Chauncey Brooks also was responsible for getting water into those homes. And, and down, and the churches in Montgomery were the Presbyterian, the, the Methodist, both built simultaneously, almost within a short distant time of each other. The Catholic Church was built in 1860. It was started in 1865. Its plans were started down here on Elizabeth Street, like I mentioned before, and also in the National Hotel. The priests from St. John's in Goshen would come down by way of railroad and go to the second floor of the National Hotel with most of the farmers in the area, and they made the plans in 1865 for it to build the Catholic Church. But because of the Civil War, it was postponed to 1868, and that's when our church was built. And on the, on the roof of it, it has originally had Santa Maria in, on, the, on the slates. But they were removed because it was difficult to get the same type of slate or any slate. It came, all the slates around all came from Pennsylvania. Percasi, Pennsylvania, was where all of these buildings that had slate roofs got their slate from there. And the big wide sidewalks were slate from there too. Of the McNeil family, that lived on the Goodwill Road at the Old Stone School, which was a Van Curen property. Van Curens owned that whole land in there, including Buck's home and, and uh, on that side of the road. 
It was the oldest and the most historic house around. Mr. McNeil's family who built or had the first store down street at the corner of Clinton and Union before the village was even incorporated. And Mr. McNeil, the last living descendant in the village here, um, was our postmaster here for years. And a chief of fire department, the most charitable gentleman to the village of Montgomery ever known. Um, these are all Victorian homes, but during the depression years of the 20, 29s, uh, Sears and Roebuck's catalog was sent to every home. And at that catalog, in that catalog, it shows different houses that you could buy by way of Sears and Roebuck. Now we have one right on Charles Street here. We have another, two more up on Union on the right and one on Union on the left. And there's been one built out in the country. They were all Sears and Roebuck houses. Excellent, they were all came in a kit. And the farmer or the owners would hire a truck to go to the depot here and pick up their kits. They even included the nails, everything, plumbing the entire house in a kit, picked up at the Montgomery Railroad. Mr. Osborne was the, uh, the train master at the time, the, and so was Mr. Mould, and they would contact the families when their kit came in. This is our depot. This is Valley Avenue. This is Oakley Street. One of the old original families, the Oakleys, who lived in Montgomery, connected with the drugstore, with Agris Drugstore. There was a school on Boyd Street. It was an elementary school. We have pictures of it. We're not sure about the, the many of the details of it, except it was a white frame building. It existed until 1960s or 70s. That was the Boyd Street School. Children went to that because it was tuition free. Those who could not afford to go to the academy before 1868, this is, and after, well, then they were, they were allowed to go to the Boyd Street School. Uh, Joe Devine's um, uh, great-grandfather was the principal there with two teachers for many years. Uh, and to the end of that is where the... Um, St. Saint, Saint Francis, it was formerly St. Andrew's Church. Yeah. Now it's called St. Francis. Yeah. That was to the back of the Boyd Street School. A senior street, a Sear Street, led down to the Montgomery St. Mary's Cemetery. It was opened about 1900, 1899, about the same time that the Methodist and Presbyterians church at the end of, of Charles Street was being developed. That was per on, purchase, on land purchased from the Sears family. The Sears family owned all of this land. Unbelievable. Now it went up as far as Dunn Road. And from Dunn Road on, it was the mold M-O-U-L-D. Sometimes it doesn't have a D, but it was the Mole family on Dunn Road. Now in between, where, where it divided to go off to Goshen and Middletown was a Stickles farm. 
That was originally called the Saratoga Farm. Saratoga, I'm not sure how it got its name, but it was owned by the Brysons. They were a very influential family here who married, whose daughter married uh, Wilkin, who was a lawyer. They were very highly regarded, had all kinds of expensive uh, events up there at the Saratoga farm. It was part of Montgomery, it's part of the village. Now, two brothers came along and bought it. That was Lloyd Stickles and Reginald, Reginald Stickles, the two brothers. They bought all, a lot of this farmland and they, they used it as farmland. But then in 1920s, the thought of having an airport was very excited in Middletown. So out to the outskirts of Middletown, um, those men who owned that airport there came down and they started an airport here for us. It was called the Tri-States Airport because it covered, of course, the three states. And it became very famous. It was the only large airport around in Orange County, in this section of Orange County. We had other small ones, like the Corbett. The Corbett Airport was up on Corbett Road, but that was a small one. But this Tri-States had all kinds of parachute jumping on Sunday afternoons. It was so, <laughs> it was so active. And everybody just enjoyed Sunday afternoons sitting along the roadside with their picnic boxes, watching the parachutes come down, watching the planes start off. And it was... It was privately owned, but yet it was public. Now there's a little road here that says Chandler Lane, which connects on over to, to uh, Neely Town Road. But the important thing about here is about here was a farm, a large farm. It belonged to the, to the Lodge family, L-O-D-G-E. They were the ones who owned Wardsbridge Inn. At that time, it was never called Wardsbridge Inn until lately. Mm -hmm. It was always called the Empire House. Yeah. They, an Irish family came and they raised their three children here, five children here. They became all influential in the village. One was the bank president. The other one owned the, helped with his father. With the, another one had a shoe store. Two ladies had uh, ladies' garments stores, and the father and mother were the ones who owned the Empire House and kept it until the mid 1900s. And then it was sold several times, and the new owners call it the the uh, Wardsbridge Inn, only because they want to bring attention to Wardsbridge but it has no connection at all with James Ward or his bridge. 